Good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison, the former dean of the school and director of several projects uh, here on Russia. And it's like old home week to have back here with us tonight uh, Grigory Yavlinsky, who uh, spent with his colleagues about uh, two months here in the spring of 1991 when he was working with a group of us at Harvard on what became the Grand Bargain, a proposition that he and I tried to sell to uh, Mr. Gorbachev in Russia and President Bush uh, here in the US. I think it's fair to say we were equally successful with both uh, audiences, namely two no sales. Uh, but since then, uh, Grigori has gone on to uh, uh, build a most interesting political career in Russia. And for having an opportunity to have him back here with us tonight to reflect on the issues of Russian economic and political reform, it's a pleasure, I think, for all of us. For those of you who don't know Grigory Yavlinsky, he is the leading presidential candidate alternative to Yeltsin today in Russia, the leading democratic reformist alternative, but in the polls also the number one alternative. And we're pleased for that uh, for the moment, even though the elections which are scheduled for June of 1996 uh, uh, require a considerable path between uh, here and there, including the Duma elections, which are scheduled for December of 1995, and which President Yeltsin in his recent uh, State of the Union message said he intends and believes will go forward on schedule. So who is Grigory Yavlinsky? He's the founder and leader of the Yabako Bloc, which is the second largest democratic reform party and faction in the Duma. He's been one of the leading thinkers about economic reform in the Soviet Union and now in Russia. First the author of the 500-day plan, then of the Grand Bargain, more recently the orchestrator of the Nizhny Novgorod demonstration case, where one's seen economic reform from the bottom up. He's a former deputy prime minister of Russia to Yeltsin a former member of the four-person directorate which ran the Soviet Union under Gorbachev in the last days. He's an intellectual entrepreneur who's established a research center in Moscow, Epicenter, that is one of the leading research centers in Russia today and offers economic and political analyses. And he's a person who feels the pulse of events in Russia. On the topic of economic reform in Russia, we couldn't therefore have a better uh, source and analyst and guest. And so it's a great honor to welcome back tonight Grigory Yavlinsky. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really very honored to have an opportunity again to stay here in the forum and to make a presentation about my country. I'm thankful ever so much for your interest to my country just now in those hard days. Then I have to make a small remark that maybe this is the first lecture in my life when I disagree with the name of the lecture. The title of my lecture is The Failure of the Reform in Russia, so I, I have to start with the point that I disagree with that. I want to say that many positive things happened since the last five or, if you want, ten years in Russia, and that's very important to feel that. And the case is why, for example, in the United States just now, the people, uh, when I was two years ago here, I was saying that maybe it will be a failure with economic transformation, not the overall reform, but the economic transformation. All my lectures were about the success of Russian reform. Now, without asking even me, everybody is calling my lectures the failure of Russian economic reform. This is a very typical for the United States, I think. So I want to explain this once again. For a very long time, I think for 10 or 20 years, it would be impossible to be very honest in saying whether it is a success in Russia or a failure. It's a, such a difficult, such a tremendous, such a 
deep transformation that there is no uh, other chance except to say that it will be a success and a failure and then again success and then again a failure and this is the way for Russia at the moment. Why it happened so that for example just now uh, the newspapers are so critical about the reform in Russia I think that the main reason is exactly because two years ago everybody here was in such an euphoria about <coughs> Russian reform. It was very strange to see that uh, next week from the beginning on transformation in January 92 all newspapers and all public in Europe and United States were, were so enthusiastic about what's going on in Russia and everything was good. Now since uh, two years passed or three years passed and just now you can see all the negative remarks about Russia and I want to assure you that both approaches are not true. There are two myths about Russia which are always making problems in evaluating what's going on in Russia. The first myth is that the Russia is already a democratic country, that we, we have already the elected president, we have a parliament, we have a constitution, we have everything and very soon maybe we would have elections. This is uh, myth number one. It's myth from the very beginning to the very end. The case is that we are not yet a democratic country simply because we have no civil society yet. We have no machinery of a feedback between the people and authorities. We have no real relationship between the power in the country and the people. And I can give you the best example which happens not so long ago with the Chechnya war. 85% of the people against the war. All political parties except fascists and nationalists and Zhirinovsky were not supporting the war. All press was against the war, except maybe one newspaper, I don't know which. And it was, everything was allowed. Everybody can say what he wants, and the president is doing what he wants. So this is a half a way of democracy. From the one side, we can do what we want, we can say what we want, we can demonstrate the protesting, but that doesn't mean that the authorities or the government or the president pay attention to what we are doing there. And this is the best example to explain. Even next elections and the elections after that, if they would be in Russia, whatever the president would be elected, it is no possibility yet to say that that will be the man who would present all nation, uh, who can speak on behalf of all nation. Because we have no still developed democratic machinery, develop democratic process. This is extremely important and have a very practical outcome in a sense that the relationship between the countries must be having in mind this very important thing. When I'm speaking to the highest level politicians everywhere, in the capitals, in Washington, the people are talking only about Yeltsin personally. They're saying whether there is, there is an alternative to Mr. Yeltsin, whether there is a other alternative, whereas there's other people in the country, but this is a strange approach. When I'm asking who would be the next president of the United States, they're saying that they don't know how we have to know who would be the next president of Russia. Why we must know that? Why we already have to say who would be the alternative? When I'm saying that, look, when you are talking only to Yeltsin and only to Kozarev, you are undermining the whole people in case you don't listen to what the people in the country are saying. This is the much more important. Because the relationship between two presidents is a very good thing and a friendship is a very good personal friendship is a very good thing, but much more important is the relations between the people. And after 1991, it happened so that all politics from the West came only directly to the highest level of the Russian leadership personally to Mr. Yeltsin and Mr. Kozarev, sometimes to Mr. Gaida. And when Mr. Clinton is coming, let's say, to Russia, his speeches has no difference with the Mr. Yeltsin's speeches. And the people feel themselves that they have one more president saying the same things, which is the Russian president is saying, and that's a serious point because 
the enthusiasm which uh, our people had at the beginning of 90s, 91, right after the coup, and the attitude to the West, attitude to the United States was so positive, also because the United States, 40 years after the war, was talking not only to the Soviet leaders, but also to the Soviet people. And that was a crucial thing, that that was two-track democracy. One more thing, you were asking me many times, I mean, in the United States, the people were asking me, and just now, Mr. Olson was saying the same things about the uh, coming elections. When in the United States you are say, saying elections, you even not thinking what it means. Elections means elections. That's it. In Russian cases, absolutely saying nothing. You would say elections, that means nothing. Because we had elections in the 20s, we had elections in the 30s, we had elections always. We had very many times elections, but they had nothing in common with what you can call democratic elections. And even in the elections of 93, they were very far from any kind of democracy. They were very close to the well-known in Russia formula. It is not important who would win, it's important who is going to count. That was the approach to Russian elections. So just today, is much more important, much more important, what kind of elections we would have in Russia. What, how would be organized the public control? What kind of the laws we are going to adopt and, pass the, and the parliament would pass for the elections? That will be much more important. At the moment, we have no one law about the future elections. No single law. There is no law about the political parties. There is no law about the public control. There is no law about the elections of the president, of the parliament, of the upper chamber, of the lower chamber, of the governors, and so on. So there is no legislation about this case. Some of those laws passed the first reading, like, for example, the version of the presidential law about the elections of the president, and the president put in this law such an exciting point that every candidate for the presidency in Russia have to give it two million signatures before he would he would be accepted as a candidate for the presidency. I wondered why two million, not two hundred million. That will be the solution for all our elections. Simply it's easy to say then that it's a problem to nobody can do this except the president which is acting. So this is the case and that's much more important than even to say at what time the elections would be. So if to summarize this political part, I would say that Russia just now have two main political questions. First, how Mr. Yeltsin is going to leave the power? I want to underline that will be the first attempt of the peaceful change of power in Russia first in the history. Russia never peacefully changed the power before. It was a precedent in 91 when peacefully Gorbachev gone, but he gone together with the country. And that was certainly peacefully, but that's a little bit too much <laughs> to change all the time the presidents together with the countries. So this is a question we have. And at the moment, this is a difficult issue. We are not sure that the people around Mr. Yeltsin is prepared to democratically, in a civil way, leave the power. As far as we know, he has 70,000 bodyguards. It's quite enough to a little bit to postpone elections and to make some problems in this transition period. So this is a question number one, because if it would not be peaceful, that would mean that the democracy in Russia would be postponed for a very long time. Second important question, what kind of elections we would have? To what extent these elections would be democratic? To what extent it would be under the public control? This is the second crucial question, because the 
democratic people, democratically orientated people, which wants in the country democracy, freedom, and the market economy. They don't want to take part in the elections, which are not fair. The last elections in autumn 93, I got 7,000 letters from my supporters. They were saying, Grigori, we are happy to help you, but we don't want to take part in those elections. We don't believe them. And as a matter of fact, even today, we have no results of the previous elections. And I have a big question. Why until now, no one Western democratic leader of any country, no one's said about that loudly. This is the support of Russian democracy. This is the support of transition period. The people want to say, to hear truth about such things. It's important for us. The second myth which we have in the country, which you have about us, much more even than we have, that we have a market economy, the only problem we have is to stabilize the budget. You have a problem to stabilize the budget, as I know just now. And we have the same problem. What is the difference? There is no difference between the United States and Soviet Union or Russia or whatever. We have the same problems. This is a very typical for all the advisors which are coming to us. They think that we have the same problems. And when they are failing to solve this problem, here they are coming to us and saying, it was very difficult to solve this problem in the US. Maybe we here would be more successful. <laughs> so, you see, we started the most difficult, most outstanding transformation one can ever imagine in economic changes. And we started it with the slogan which we gave to all nations, budget without deficit. Now imagine the prices in one week in 92 jumped up 500 times and in Vladivostok the mothers with the babies were asking the local authorities what happened why 500 times a week the answer was we have to stabilize the budget in Moscow you know it was a very very strange approach to our reform here I want to say what is the myth the myth is like that Russian economy was never damaged by central planning. The economy of Poland was damaged by central planning. Czech economy, Eastern, Euro, Eastern Germany was, the economy of Eastern Germany was damaged by central planning. Russian economy was created by central planning. This is a different animal. It started from the grassroots. It was organized like one factory, literally. In 80 years, it was over-monopolized as a main policy line. It was prepared to work without laws. It was prepared to work without public control. Finally, it was prepared to work without money. And to say to such economy that just in one week we're going to liberalize you? This is a big question, what we are doing? What is our task? To liberate old Soviet monopolies or to liberate society from the old Soviet monopolies and old Soviet economy? This is a two different strategies, by the way. And finally, what we get from that approach, we started with the first line, we started of the liberation of the old Soviet monopolies and old old Soviet structures, and we just now have the over-monopolistic, oligarchic, criminal state and criminal economy. And that was obvious from the very beginning, because Soviet economy, from the point of view, I want to stress that, from the point of view of the open economy was oligarchic and mafia economy type from the very beginning. It was built in this way. It was absolutely impossible to say that you have in Soviet or Russian economy independent economic agents which would respond on the monetary policy which you want to introduce. 
Mr. Balcerovich had a much more success in his Polish reform, first of all because he had a private agriculture which responded to the monetary policy immediately. And this is absolutely clear why. In Russian case, that was impossible. So before we would be able to stabilize the budget, before we would be able to stabilize the currency, which is absolutely necessary, and stabilization of budget and stabilization of our currency is the ultimate goal of our economic reform, we have to pass the period very substantial period of the institutional changes like demonopolization, private property rights, competition, free trade, economic union with the former Soviet Union and republics, first steps in making industrial policy. And all this must be done in the same time with a very tough control to the inflation and certainly to the central bank because this is not our goal to give possibility to the central bank and to the Minister of Finance to make a huge inflation in the country. But it is necessary to understand that this is impossible to stabilize the budget every Saturday. We are trying to do that three years, year after year. We are failing all this time and we are trying to do this again just now. We have to stop that because we have to find the reason why we are not able to stabilize the economy. Last year was a big enthusiasm also in the United States about 4% inflation a month if you remember. What was the result? The result was 11th of October when the explosion of the ruble smashed all that. Last year by the way I'm calling the last year as a year of the open black boxes. The first box which was opened last year was the box where we saw quasi-economic reform. This 11th of October, when inflation jumped up from 4% to 25 in one hour. The second black box was the Budapest meeting, which opened that we have no foreign policy at all. And the third one, was a Chechnya invasion, military invasion to our democracy, which showed what the type of the internal policy we have. Now there is no question about what's going on in Russia. I simply want to ha say that that was clear much more before. And if uh, to use the approach, looking at the Russian case with the hot heart and cold mind that would be clear that would be clear from the very beginning that it is too small period of time three years to overcome everything but now there's three open black boxes showed very explicitly what is the really the case in Russia and summarizing all that I want to say what the question which I often say what must be the line from my point of view in the West about the Russian Federation just now. I would say starting with the point which, with, with which I started my presentation. Remember, Russian leaders and Russian people, this is a two different things. Russia must not be in isolation because just now Russia two or three years ahead from now, would self-identify it itself. If Russia is going to self, to self-identification in isolation, that will be very dangerous. And this is, have nothing in common with the policy towards the personalities, to Mr. Yeltsin and to the others. This is the case for Russian situation today. I think that uh, that would be like an introduction. Now I'm ready to answer your questions. Uh, 
let me invite uh, uh, short uh, counter arguments and questions. And the floor is open. There are microphones on both sides of the floor. Grigori uh, enjoys a good argument, and so uh, we trust that uh, he'll get one. And uh, please identify yourself. Just stand up at the, uh, at the microphones and say who you are, because this is being uh, recorded for public television or public sir, radio. Sir, Michael Lellyveld of Journal of Commerce. Um, two questions, if I may. One is that your party, I believe, was the only one of the reform parties to vote against the budget, which was recently passed with 7.7 percent .7 of uh, uh, GDP as a deficit. Um, could you for tell us why? And also, on the subject of uh, pending IMF aid, um, do you support it at this time? And if so, how can a separation be made between the $6.3 billion which IMF is considering as a loan and the projected $5 billion cost of the war in Chechnya? How can the IMF lend the money without somehow supporting the, uh, the debt that has been incurred for the war in Chechnya? Thank you. Our budget has a lot of problems, and I'm, but I'm going to use just now only one thing to explain what I think about our budget at the moment. Our budget has a 73 trillion rubles uh, deficit, as you know. The idea of the current budget is that the fif about 50 percent of this budget deficit would be covered by the loans of IMF. And the 50 percent of that would be covered by the state security bonds which the government want to sell in Russia. I would not give anyone percent that that would happen. Especially second thing. I'm sure that Russian government is able to sell more state security bonds in the United States than in Russia. <laughs> it's absolutely impossible. So I don't believe that this budget is at least on 25 percent realistic. Secondly, I think this is not a professional approach to cover the half of the budget by the money which is coming from the IMF. This is not right. Simply, this is not an economic policy. Thirdly, in Russia, we gathered last year only the government gathered 35 percent taxes, only 35 percent from what the government have to take to, to, to make the budget. What, what are the changes in our policy which are saying that this year will be different? What lessons we got from that? If there is no changes, there is, there is no lessons, so how can I think that this year the budget would be much more realistic than the last year. And the last point, we don't, to, we don't want to fund Chechnya. We don't want to fund killing the people there. Dozens of thousands of people are already killed there. And my party is not going to vote for the budget, which is not saying no to this military operation in Chechnya. These are the reasons. We have enough professional reasons and political reasons to say now that we are not going to vote for that budget. Nevertheless, that we are chairing the budget committee and we are trying to improve the budget. But we think that that was a case that in August last year, IMF started negotiations with the Russian government about the budget, all the time promising the $6.3 billion and six billion dollars which is coming from World Bank and the other uh, international financial institutional organizations and then we need six billion dollars as a stabilization fund by the way if we want to support the rate of exchange rate so that's 18 billion dollars I don't believe to such figures and even even more than that even if you have this money I'm I would say Again and again, this money must not be used in this way. 
This is not a professional approach in making economic policy in the country, such a big country as, for example, Russia. This is the main point. And what is about your second question about this money from MF and Chechnya? So I think that this is the clear question and the clear answer. This is one pocket. So who's going, who, who would be able to say that this is a different money? My name is Fad Dengler. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, two short questions. The first one is there were reports today that the Duma might not ratify the START II treaty, and I just wanted your perspectives on that. And the second was, uh, what's your and your party's position on the expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe, including the Baltic countries? Mm -hmm. What about the uh, ratifying the treaties? The main problem, one of the main problems of our leadership in the country is absolutely uh, they are absolutely not able to make any kind of a public policy. For example, that was a very explicit example when it was the trainings of Russian and American troops last summer. The information about that came to the parliament almost the same day when the trainings must start. No explanations, no discussions, no, nothing. Simply, suddenly and unexpectedly, one guy came to the Duma, to the parliament and said, you know, guys, today we would have, together with the Americans, some trainings in Ural Mountains. The people think that this is, together with the Americans, mean with a group from Harvard Institute or something like that. <laughs> And when he named the number of the soldiers which are coming, it was a sour surprising for the people there. No public policy. If you want to do so, and this is the right thing from my point of view, it's necessary to start from January saying every day, clarifying to the people what's going on. It's the same if, if the chairman of the parliament would come saying, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, so today we are going to go to the swimming pool. And, people would be rather surprised by that. If he was going to say about the swimming pool half a year, everybody would be prepared for that. The same with this. No presidential statement about that. No explanations from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. No vision of the Ministry of Defense. Nothing. And that's why it is so difficult. The same happens with the Japanese islands. When the president is leaving Moscow next day for the visit, evening before he starts discussion in the country, what to do with the islands. Certainly it's absolutely impossible to do anything with that. So this is a new school must be for our leaders. What means public policy? How to speak to the people? How to open the main processes of making politics in the country? That's what, even Chechnya was not prepared. And one day we, we were informed that 2,000 tanks and 40,000 people went to Chechnya. No explanation, only afterwards. So this is the case why it happens. And your second question was about NATO. You know, I want, one of the principles of the policy what I want to implement in my country is not to say the others what they should do. That will be a new political culture in Russia. We have to say, solve our problems and not to make the problems to the others. This, is, this may be the slogan for our politics for 20 years. We have enough problems ourselves. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have no answer in this question. But in this political culture, the answer would sound like that. From our point of view, from my point of view, we, Russia, not need any kind of political or military union with Ukraine or Belarus. So I'm against any kind of political or military unions on the western direction from Russia 
We have no danger from that side. Economic union, yes. No military, no political union with Belarus and Ukraine, Moldova, or whatever is on the west from Russia. I think this is the answer on the question of the expansion of NATO. Yes, I'm Richard Falconer, the postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Science and International Affairs. There have been a number of reports in the Russian press that Western agencies and universities are seeking to undermine Russia through contacts and gathering information and conducting collaborations, such as the kind that you occasionally have participated in. And among those agencies and institutions named was Harvard among them. And I wonder if for you, your ongoing collaboration or occasional collaboration with Harvard is any sort of political liability. You mean in Russia, this publication? I'm refer yes, I'm referring, it's a report that was put out by the Federal Investigative Service. Yeah. Oh. Which Forget about that. Uh, so you <laughs> and you don't. All this is senseless. And, and so my, my, actually that is a, uh, a lead into the question that you don't feel that your Western orientation is in any way a political liability for you. In opposite, everybody knows in Russia my orientation. Everybody knows why I'm here, just for example today. Everybody knows what I'm saying. I was in Kazan. The people were asking me about the Harvard, Institute, Harvard University, what they're doing in Tatarstan, this and the other things. Everybody knows how close I am. I started this grand bargain that was the first plan about the joint, joint moving forward between the United States and the Western world and, and Soviet Union and Russia. And I think that uh, don't believe all the talks about the anti-Americanism in Russia. This is not true. The difference between what it was and what it is is like follows. In 1990, our people had a feeling that you have a recipe what we must do. Now they had no such feeling. <laughs> this is the only difference. Mark Kleiman, I'm on the faculty here. Two related questions. It's been reported in the Western press, but also by uh, members of some of the Russian delegations who've been here, um, that economic development is being severely limited uh, by extortion by organized criminal groups against enterprises they start up. Uh, to what extent is that true, and is there anything plausible to do about it? Uh, related to that, it's also been reported that unemployment in the chemical industry and among uh, academic chemists uh, has led, among other things, to the development of an export industry in synthetic narcotics and other uh, illicit drugs. Uh, to what extent is that true, and to what extent is there anything useful to do about that? This criminal side of, of the situation in Russia is really very serious, extremely. and. Uh, and what, uh, the only thing I want to say that the only way to, to fight that is a demonopolization and private property rights. You have just now the situation when there is no real private property rights and everything is over monopolized. So you can recall simply the, let's say, 70 or, or 80 years ago in Chicago where I was today morning they were recalling this until now, what, what happens at that time there, for example, and many other places of your country. You have a La Guardia airport, that means that you were fighting corruption even after a, about 200 years of development of your country, and we have three years of that. So this is absolutely clear when you are coming from the totalitarian economy to the open one, you have that situation. Besides that, uh, we just only just now finished with the, as you know, voucher privatization. And this is an enormous lottery which passed the country, or the country passed this lottery, I don't know what, what it happens. But as a result, we collectivized industries. And this is a very strange that Americans supported collectivization. It was a collectivization of every culture in uh, 30s. Now Americans hardly support it politically uh, collectivization of our industries. Congratulations. So now we have 40% of this shares which goes to the workers, 40% of shares goes to the state, 20% of shares comes to the, in the hands of the, of the manager. 
Who is managing the enterprise in this case? I'll tell you. Manager, supplier, consumer, and criminals. So I think that the main way uh, to reduce the criminals, to reduce the level of the criminality, is deregulation, further deregulation as soon as possible. Because we still have, we still have licenses, quarters, especially in oil, gas, and such things. This is not, when you have such things, there is no way to avoid. Second thing is demonopolization, certainly, and private property rights, and, and preserving com competition, implementing and then preserving competition. This is the only normal way to fight all these things. And your experience in 20s and 30s gives us a very good example that that's possible to do. If you could do that, we also could do that. I think so. Thanks. And unemployment in the chemical industries. So generally speaking, we have a big problem with unemployment, which sounds like that. We have a 50% decline in average production between 89 and just today. 50% industrial production, 89 to 95 average, and 1% unemployment. 1% unemployment. That means that the system, like a market system, absolutely not working. Irrelated figures, you see that. But what about the real situation? Certainly it's about 12, I would say 12, 14% this hidden unemployment, covered unemployment. Especially about the chemical industries, I want to say my mother is a professor of chemistry. She was teaching chemistry since 1946 to 1984 in the university. She's just now retiring. Her pension is five dollars a month. So what to say about the others? And let's say young people which graduated Moscow State University in theoretical physics. This year, absolutely have no jobs. Mathematicians have no jobs. Chemi chemistry, physics, all these things have no jobs. This is a current situation. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Jim Ellison. I'm a student at MIT. I had two uh, short uh, related questions, if I may. Um, I'm not sure how reliable the information is, but I heard that the Moscow Olympic Stadium was bought for the grand sum of $500. Uh, my question is, to what extent has privatization been a transfer of state property into the hands of the politically powerful? Uh, my second question is, uh, you spoke about land reform. What is the reason for such little progress? Is it lack of political will at the top, or is it some grassroots opposition? This is maybe true, I don't know exactly nothing about the stadium. But I know about many other, even more surprising stories. How the people are buying for nothing. And I'll tell you one interesting story, a new one. The last year you were reading in a Business Week, in Economist especially, Marvelous stories about how the investors are buying big enterprises in Russia, how the things are going, the, the people are buying shares, all that, the process is on the way. Now all these people who bought all these huge things, about 100,000 people working there or something like that, now they all are in the budget committee in the parliament and in the government. They're saying, uh, please, you have to finance this all. We are not prepared to do that. But we are saying, okay, but that's your property. 49%, 51%, you bought all that. This is your private owners. They say, sorry, we, we took it by chance with the vouchers, you know, but we can't afford that. We have no money to invest. So you have to continue to finance all that. And we are saying, okay, so what is the idea? So I'm going to take taxes from all the people and to finance your private enterprise. This is a funny story, isn't it? And then the talk is going forward in the way I can't repeat it. 
<laughs> so this is the first thing. So that's very possible what you are saying. The case is just now how to move to the real privatization from all these games. It was very painful games. When Zhirinovsky was saying during his election campaign that he's going to give every woman a husband, at the same time Chubais was saying that he's going to give everybody a property. Is this a big difference between t these two things? I don't know whether the women feel themselves tricked after Zhirinovsky's victory at the, at the parliamentarian elections, but what about the privatization? I know for sure that everybody's feel themselves very surprised by what happens. What about the land reform, what you said? 100% a problem is of, of the political will on the top, 100%. No other obstacles. This is the problem of the political leadership in the country. Nothing else. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Vladimir Brovkin at the History Department and the Russian Research Center. I just wanted to uh, first say that it's so refreshing to hear some interesting and critical observations after a story from Mr. Sobchak last week that said that everything's wonderful in Russia. It's absolutely perfect. There's a market economy and democracy working. So my question really has to do with elections. Uh, and could you elaborate, if you could, about the strategy that you may have for elections? The, the reason I'm asking that is that there's a popular perception in Russia that the Democrats are to blame. Uh, it perhaps is a false perception, but that is the perception. The Democrats have sold Russia to the capitalists, and they mismanage privatization. You're a Democrat. Whether you're to blame or not, people blame you, among others. So what will your message be to the people to convince them that Democrats are not to blame, that you have to move in this direction? And in this regard, who are your allies? Can you work with Gaidar? Will the Democratic Front have a united list or coalition? Will you yourself personally be a candidate in presidential elections? Yeah, the last question is the easiest one. <laughs> um, the majority of the people in my country wants to go forward to democracy and market economy with the understanding that this is the only way for prosperity, security, and normal life. The people disagree with the way how we are doing that. Mr. Goidar, Mr. Gaidar, Mr. Yeltsin are the faces which represents this, I would say, very specific way to the democracy and market economy which brought us to 1,000% inflation a year, about dozens of billions of dollars leaking from the country, corruption, bribes, bureaucracy, which is in more than in the Soviet Union, much more. They represent this course. They brought us to the bridge with the tanks in October 93 opposite the White House, now they brought us to Chechnya. People don't want all that. They are not saying that they don't want normal economy and normal life with the laws and order, but they don't want to make law and order in the way Mr. Yeltsin is doing that in Chechnya. I was saying from the very beginning that there is another way and there is a, this way is not a way at all. I was staying here three years ago saying the same thing. Mr. Yeltsin is a man who is creating enemies all the time. First it was Gorbachev, then Parliament, then Zhirinovsky, then Chechnya. This is the way of making revolutions. But this is not the way of making reforms. People don't want to have revolutions. People want to have reforms. Reforms means peacefully, peacefully and successfully. Let it be the success would be like this, but every day and peacefully. Whatever I'm saying here just now, I'm saying in every village when I'm traveling during the country, I'm making the same presentations. I was astonished 
two days ago when I was making a presentation in the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, saying absolutely the same speech, which I'm going to say, which I'm saying already and said the last week, the week before that, in Chilabins to the coal miners which are not paid six weeks. Certainly I used different expressions in the different way presented that, but the sense was absolutely the same. Here is the point. There are many people which are saying like this, if this and this persons are in the list of the Democrats, please take me out. That's why the name of my party is not liberal democratic, democratic liberal, social democratic, or whatever, all that. We have a liberal Democrats with Zhirinovsky, liberal Democrats with Fyodorov, liberal Democrats, a liberal democratic front among the communist movement, Guy is liberal democrat, the people are crazy from that. They don't understand all that. That's why I'm standing with my name, not with this, with these labels. And that makes real problem in answering this very typical question, whether the Democrats can unite and all this. I would lose all confidence. Next day, when I would say that we are all together, we are fighting, they would say, okay, now that's clear for us what that means. Yes, the people who are supporting uh, Mr. Gaidar, they're ready to support us, but my people is not ready to support them. We have a different situation in the country. We have different Democrats. We have a Democrats who were and is in the power, uh, who are responsible for everything, including Chechnya. This is the point. So I think when it would be the elections of the, of the parliament, we would go separately. And that is right. We would have more seats, by the way. When that will be the elections of the president, yes, we would find one name. And we would find a way how to support one name, because that is too serious. And this is the type of elections where we have to find the one name. That's what I'm fighting. I said in February 93 that I'm going to run the presidential elections. I want to repeat, yes, I'm going to run the elections. I don't want to live in a country where the only one alternative to Mr. Yeltsin are the fascists, are the communists. I'm Laurent Rosekis with Cambridge Energy Research Associates. You mentioned the importance of an economic union uh, among the former Soviet states. Uh, how do you view the current processes of economic reintegration? Uh, and what's your opinion as to how that, those processes should be managed, uh, what the Russian government's role should be, in, and also as to the future of the Commonwealth of Independent States as an institution? Commonwealth of Independent States, I would characterize in those ways. Uh, no wealth and nothing in common. <laughs> so it works in this way until today. So this is all dreams which were created somewhere in the sauna. <laughs> so now seriously what I want to say that it's absolutely obvious for me and I'm fighting for that all the time, fighting for that all the time and I'm going to push it more and more strongly, we need to organize real market on the space of the former USSR with the economic union, with all former Soviet Union republics who wants to enter. I know Baltics didn't, no problem. I'm speaking about Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan and some others. There is the natural way for development of the market economy, the markets. I would prefer, by the way, if the loans which we were talking would go just tomorrow to Ukraine and Belarus and would support their trade balance with Russia. That would be much more useful for Russian economy than to give fresh money to Russia for nothing. And then they're they're go going back to the other pockets in Switzerland. This is not, this is not a policy. 
Recall, please, 1947, United States were giving money to Italy to buy German products. And that was the way to develop German economy. That, that's, that's the policy. So I think that strong economic union with the payment union, maybe with the banking union, with the customs union, with the mutual understanding in the issues of investments and preserving the property, each other, and so on and so on, property rights, all these things, very important for Russia and for the others. And this is the way to decrease the inflation because having markets, we need less loans. We don't need to give loans for restructuring many other things if we have low, if we have markets. So this is, this is the, and what happens to us? We lose Eastern European market, then we lose uh, former Soviet Union republics as a market. Now we are losing our internal market. It's a strange thing. It is a very, tr I, I, I hardly can imagine what we are going to do in one or two years if we would go develop, we would go the same way. That we, when you come to Moscow and you see this casinos, restaurants, hotels, BMW, Mercedes is the number which is more than in Germany, I think. This is tremendous things, all is so expensive, much more expensive than here, by the way. This is a natural question, how it happens all that? Our reformers are saying this is the, this is the like a main advertising of, of our reforms. I'll give you the main sources, how it happens. First is the difference in prices, internal and internal, and world prices on oil and gas. They were 3%, our price on the oil and gas as average was 3% from the world price when we started reform. Now it's 60%. So this is a strong force, strong, strong source. Secondly, free privatization. Thirdly, free land. Fourth, budget. Simply using the budget, uh, the, the money from the budget, the commercial banks are speculating with this money. Fourth, uh, this is a black business. This is not the same which is a black market. I'm a great supporter of the black market because the black market it, at least is the market. But the black business is something very different from that. I mean, nuclear things, drugs, uh, weapons, and things like that. And then I would say laundry. We are acting like a laundry which is washing the money from all over the world. And certainly our people who are washing the money get some money from that. On my estimations, we got about two or three billion dollars every year only from this procedure. So, once again, you ask me about the, one of the most crucial issues. Just now, Russian government is still not prepared for that. Uh, Russian government don't want to have any economic union. Russian government pre prefers to have a, something military instead of economic union. I mean, Yeltsin preferred. But sooner or later, we would move that way. We need a Euro-Asian market. This is the future for that place. My name is Paul Podolsky. I'm a graduate student at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, it may be uh, sort of the, the, the autumn of the patriarch, as, as one of our journalists said, but I'm interested to know what's your assessment of Boris Yeltsin and how's his health? What about his health? I don't know. I saw him last time in December 91 when he offered me to be a prime minister and I rejected. I said that I don't want to be his prime minister. That was the last meeting, so I don't know. What I can see in the television, maybe he is too much Russian from time to time, maybe, but that doesn't mean that he feels himself badly. Maybe that exactly seems the sign that he feels himself well. So I don't know. What about his health? And what is my feeling about his, him? Yeltsin's era finished, period. Hi, Amy Singleton, professor of Russian and director of Russian studies at the College of the Holy Cross. Um, 
At the Center for Gender Studies in Moscow, a group of scholars says that democracy without women is not democracy. And it would be dangerously short-sighted to build a civil society without at least half the members of that society included. Russian women in myth and reality have always played an important role in the Russian economy and in other areas important to the nation. But as recipients of trickle-down liberation, they have played very limited roles in policy making and decision making. You are a Democrat, and I would like to ask you how women play an active role in your party and what role they would take in your administration if you were to win the presidency. Yeah. I feel myself very dangerous in this situation <laughs> because I know that in the United States this is the case. As a Democrat, I would say that I think that not only democracy without women is not a democracy, I would say that life without women is not a life. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I, I, I will, I, I'm not prepared to say that I would have some, uh, some special structure in, in terms of uh, how many percent of women would be in my administration or in my campaign. I simply really don't know. But what I can to say that Russian society is much more based on the women's hands or shoulders than any other society in the world. And the, certainly the political role of the women, the, that part of the society which, which are just now in the hardest position in the country, certainly is not adequate to, to what it must be. But being very honest, that will not be a point of my problem. That will be a little bit later, OK? Uh, <clears throat> I'm Nicholas Danilov of the School of Journalism at Northeastern University. Um, I have two and a half questions. First uh, concerns elections. Um, I have that sneaking sense that we should be worried that Boris Yeltsin will not let the elections of June 96 go ahead that he enjoys power too much, and that he will try to stay in power. Second question is, if that doesn't happen and you do run for president of Russia, who do you expect to be your competitors, your adversaries? And the half question is this. Uh, your party is the Yablaka party, the apple party. In this country, we have two things called apples, the big apple of New York, and the chewed-in apple of Macintosh computers. What kind of an apple are you? Uh, my party, the name of my party is very much related to my name. And the rumors are saying that I'm a rather tasty apple. <laughs> now, what about the elections? Uh, I still have a feeling that the elections might happen. This is maybe one of the parts of my tactics. That's why I'm saying that I would be a president in order to have some people from the Democratic side whom Mr. Yeltsin have to ask before he would cancel the elections. What are you guys thinking about that? If nobody would say that he's going to take part in the elections, so it's, this is not, he would say one day he would show up in the television between the cartoons, and then he would say that, sorry, there is no candidates appropriate for the election, so I decided them to cancel. When you would be grown up more, I would think, maybe I would reconsider. But for today, we have no place for elections. We have no, you don't want Zhirinovsky, so no question. I still think that the elections would happen. But once again, this is not the main issue. The main issue, what kind of elections that would be. Pay more attention to that. We badly need your intellectual and moral support in this issue. What kind of elections? It can be even postponed for two or three months, for half a year. But they must be a step towards the democracy. They must be a step. I understand that it's impossible to make real democratic elections. I don't know whether you consider that you have a real democratic elections. I don't know. But the step might be. The results might be open. Last time in 93, we have the 
the elections uh, finished at 10 o'clock in the evening. In 11, the president already declared what happens. Having 110, 110 voters, million voters, is it, is it? So, then who would be the competitors? The competitors would be one guy from the fascists and nationalists. I don't know whether it will be Zhirinovsky or somebody else, but that for sure, because this is a special ideology, you know? They would find, maybe they would, three comes to the elections, but in fact, it's one. I mean, communists would be the second one. Yeltsin, if he would take part, and me. You think Yeltsin would take part? You know, the Yeltsin's decision about taking part in the elections, in fact, is not his decision. You have a crowd of people around him which are saying, who else if not you? Maybe they would convince him, I don't know. But I hardly can imagine him in 2000. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Evgenia Albert, PhD uh, student at Harvard and uh, political analyst with Izvesti. Uh, would you please, I have one question. You mentioned that country is run by oligarchy right now, and I feel uh, that that's correct. Would you please to tell me how are they going to conduct the elections? And how are you going to survive during the next two years? Take into, into consideration the way they started to fight with their political rivals right now. I have no answer. Uh, this is the answer whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist. If to be an optimist in Russia, that means to be paralyzed after the first failure. And failure is always with you. If to be a pessimist, that means to be paralyzed from the very beginning. So the only way to survive in Russia is to say to yourself, just do it. This is not a case of making very long forecast what would happen and if Yeltsin would go that way and that way. It's not the way to say that uh, one or the other politician can be what happened to Mr. Yel Listiv uh, to yesterday. This is not a case to speak about that. This is our task, just do it. So there is no reasonable answer on this case. What about how they would conduct elections? That's why I'm saying that this is the most important question. This is a really the most important question of our future. What kind of a machine, electoral machine, we would create? that it has been already created. FAPSI created the electronic system elections that allows uh, government to control all the channels of voting. Yes, certainly we can, can, can discuss this issue and in the endless way, and I know all these arguments, that's why I'm saying again and again, the case how the elections will be organized in Russia is the main case. Thank you. Hello, I'm Boris Neville with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I've got two, question, two questions. The first one, uh, the performance of the Russian army in Chechnya was quite a shock for the rest of the world. And anybody who has any idea about the state of the Russian army understand that it's probably disintegrating and the command is no longer manageable. What, do you have any insights or comments about the decision of President Yeltsin to reshuffle the command of the Russian army and to reform it. And the other question is, uh, I know that you are coming from Lvov, from Ukraine. If you were invited back to Ukraine to lead the government or to take some other position, would you take this offer or? Uh, already I have a nickname that I'm a hand of United States in Russia. You want me to be a hand of Moscow in Ukraine, yeah? <laughs> this is a past speculation. When, some, when the prices are going up, inflation, people not thinking what's wrong with economic policy. They're trying to find, maybe this is a special idea. It comes from Moscow to make harm for Ukraine or whatever. I'm ready to help Ukraine any day and any time, and that's what I'm doing with the, your leaders any time they ask me. But uh, we are not talking just now at all about the official position. 
Uh, what about the Chechnya? This is not a case of Russian military. This is a case of Mr. Yeltsin personally. This is, I, I hate this approach when uh, some Democrats are saying that uh, Yeltsin should change the mi Minister of Defense. This is not a case. The Minister of Defense is the Minister of Defense. Maybe we have a very specific Minister of Defense. That's true. But in any case, he was not acting on behalf of himself. He was, he was uh, realizing the order of the President. If the President won't want to do that, so it is necessary to stop that. That's it. So this is not the case. What about the reforming the Russian army? I want simply to say, when I call for resignation of Mr. Yeltsin, I had in mind that from my point of view, Russian leadership at the, at the moment is not able to make any kind of reform, not economic, not political, no the reform in the army, anything like that. So you don't think that Russian army may be a threat to, to the West or to some neighbors in the Commonwealth? Russian Itself, army... acting independently. Uh, Russian army is an organized force, not. Because Russian army was used during last two years twice to solve internal political problems. And Russian army would never forgive Yeltsin that he used the Russian army for such purposes. That's why we have for the first time the split among the generals, among the leaders of the army about the case in Chechnya. Hi, Joel Hellman from the government department here at Harvard. Um, you mentioned that there's a big gap between the political leadership and the people. I'm wondering how large is Yablaka? Um, what are you doing in order to build up a political party organization? Um, where, in fact, do you, do you even get funds for a, building a mass organization? Um, and I'd like to talk more about your efforts to build Yablaka up into a political party. And finally, just a brief question. If, if you were successful, would you reverse any elements of privatization? You were critical of the privatization process. Um, would you reverse any elements that have, that have gone up to this point? Okay. So in case of Yablaka or in case of Apple, I would say that Apple is just now not so small that somebody can swallow it all at once, but not so big to be a dinner. So we have 85, or oh sorry, 58 regional organizations. And the strength of our movement is not just clear enough, if to be very honest. We have two types of Yablaka. We have a youth organization. We are the first who have the youth organization, which is violent voluntarily organized as the 47 universities and institutes from the whole country. And we have 58 organizations. And we will see to what extent it's strong. Uh, we have a very different approach to making our party from the, all the other political forces. Uh, the thing is that we are not making the vertical party. We are not making the party of the leader. We are making the party which is including regional political movements, which are very different, but which are fighting for their own goals, like elections of the uh, governors, mayors, uh, local laws, such things. So we already have a party in the cases to develop it, but without laws about the party, without clear point what kind of a state is Russia. Because one thing is a presidential republic in the United States, or presidential power. But Germany also have a president. Here, the parties is not very important. And in Germany, they are absolutely crucial. They are making our political system. So this is the open questions for us, and we have to solve them. And only time would show that. What about the privatization? No, I wouldn't go back. No one step. But forward, I would go in a different way. Meaning the privatization in a clear, open, public way for money with investors, strategic owners, clear private property rights. That's possible. We have such examples in the country. We know how to do that. We made several plans 
of the making such procedures. This is the case. Nigel Gould Davis, uh, the Harvard Government Department. Um, you expressed concern about the undemocratic character of the Russian political system. Uh, presumably you have some criticisms of the Constitution, which, as I recall, Yablaka did not support during the referendum. If Yablaka gains more seats in December, or if you become president the following year, will you try to change the Constitution? And if so, how? First of all, I want to explain once more. I'm not saying that system in, in Russia is just now anti-democratic. I'm saying that we have no democracy yet. This is two different things. It's very important. Uh, secondly, yes, we are against that constitution because, uh, among the other things, we consider that the two things were not solved in the constitution. Absolutely. First, it was a wrong decision about the level of concentration of power in the hands of Mr. Yeltsin. He has just now power more than any president or taking all the president together. This is unsayable power. Even the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, in fact, had no such power because he had something like a Politburo or whatever. This person has all power. What happens in this case, I'm, I think that here in Harvard, it is not necessary to explain what are the consequences of such situation, but in fact, what happens in our case is that the, the power simply went from the hands to the unknown people. They are manipulating the power. The people surround, which are surrounding the president simply acting in some branches like the president himself. And this is extremely dangerous, unsavably dangerous. So the second part is the federation. We didn't solve the problem with the federation. This is simply artificial decision about 89 uh, members of federation. This would never work. So this is two main directions of the improving of constitution. The part of my political program would be that I would reduce the power of the president. I'll be the president, which would bring to the parliament. This is my obligation. The law, which would redevise the power between the president, government, and parliament. I want to have a real government. I want to have a real parliament, and this is the only way to be a real president. I don't want to be a president of banana republic. Uh, that's it. I'm curious about uh, someone you mentioned several times tonight. That's Alexander Zhervnosky. Is that the name? No, Zhervnosky. this guy is not known to me. I know Vladimir, and that's enough. I. Uh, I've heard there are a lot of people asking questions that are experts on Russia. I am by no means an expert. I watch the news and I see a man come on talking about taking Alaska back from the United States. Who is this man? <laughs> what does he stand for? And is he a, a real threat to the stability within Russia? And is he a threat between, uh, to peace between the West and Russia? And, and peace within the Soviet Union itself. The old Thank you. And first of all, I want to say, don't worry about Alaska. <laughs> this, is, this is the main message. Uh, secondly, I want to say that, what about Zhirinovsky? This is a man which is uh, extremely populistic, extremely. I, I already gave the example. He's saying that about the husbands. So saying that we have to conquer Indian Ocean immediately, this is the main task for Russia at the moment, and things like that. But being serious, I want to say, you were very afraid when the Zhirinovsky uh, uh, won the elections in 93. And everybody was asking, what would happen if Zhirinovsky would be in power? What would happen? Look, just now he's in power. What's going on just now in Russia, this is exactly what would happen if Zhirinovsky would be in power? Chechnya, all the stories. And this is not uh, simply by accident that he is the only party which is supporting Mr. Yeltsin. Maybe it will be a little bit more even exotic. But something like that would happen if he would be in power. Secondly, mm, I don't think that he would win the elections because he have about 10-12% of the people which constantly support him. 
And I have a feeling that every, every country in the world which have problems, and all countries have problems, have 10, 12 percent of the people which are supporting always such stuff, type of mentality yeah, like Zhirinovsky has. Zhirinovsky got six hours television for free from Yeltsin before the elections. In two weeks before the elections. I'm afraid that if in Germany he would get, such, such guy would get six hours in two weeks before the elections in Germany, he would have more than 12 percent. More. He would say, all Turks out, I would give the jobs to the Eastern Germans, I would give them their money, I would give them their flats, or whatever, whatever, and, and the vote would be stronger than even in Russia. So, my idea is, if, and only if, elections would be more or less democratic and under the public control, maximum what Zhirinovsky can get, it's a 10%. If that would be a mess and not the elections, people who are supportive to the other forces, my electorate, for example, simply wouldn't come, and his people would come, and he would get, like last time, 24% from the amount of the comers. And uh, as a person, as a person, uh, you know, this is the case, this is the how to say, this is a medical case, I simply don't know this words in English. <laughs> I can't explain. This is necessary to go to the special hospital to discuss with the specialists. My name is Kevin Spensley. Uh, you mentioned you gave a few examples a little earlier about how difficult it is for the Russian people to make themselves heard by their leadership. You also, perhaps quite rightly, cr criticized the American government for treating Yeltsin a little too much as the voice of the American people. My question is, how, what in the opinion of the Russian people, the ones who make themselves heard by you, what in, what in their opinion can the United States do to help Russia in the reforms? I never asked Russians how America can help them before, when I would ask them, when I would be there, but I think the answer is that our task is to make reform. Your task is to say truth about that reform. That's it. Very simple as this. Because for us it's very important to feel all the time criteria and to have the possibility to use your historical experience, intellectual experience which you, which you have. The main, the, the main help to us would be your intellectual, moral, and political support. Your understanding of what's going on in Russia. That's absolutely enough. All the other things would happen themselves. I apologize for the other people that are up, but, but on that note, we've come to 7.30, so I'm going to have to ask you to ask your question after. We want to say thank you very much to Grigory Yavlinsky for coming back.